Okay. Hello, Pamela. Hi, Fraser. How's it going? It, it's a snowy, white, I guess, wonderland here. Really? It it was sh it was literally shorts and t-shirt weather yesterday. <laughs> I don't know, like last week, we were talking about just you know that it was uh, a terrible frozen hellscape for both of us, and yeah. and yet it was unbelievably warm. It was amazing. Yeah. yeah, we have I think four or five inches of snow on the ground, and it just shows no signs of ever melting. So I'm going to do a quick promotion. Well, not a promotion exactly, but uh, we're giving away our Phases of the Moon app totally free today. And it's only today, and it's the one for iOS, so it's for the iPhone and the iPad, which we've never done before, and we'll never do again. Um, but, but uh, yeah, so so if you've never installed it, it's totally free. Normally we sell it for $1.99, but uh, all I ask, if you want to do it, install it, is just uh, write us a review, and that'll really help. So, so uh, we have an app that is not free, but if you spend a dollar ninety nine to get the Cosmic Quest Earth or Not Earth app over on the Google Play Store, iOS coming eventually, um, that dollar ninety nine after Google takes its share is going to support continued programming at Cosmic Quest. It's a great new app for uh, learning the differences between different surfaces throughout our solar system, and it has geology flashcards, and it has games that are surprisingly difficult where you try and identify whether or not you're looking at the planet Earth. You think you could answer it? No. No. no <laughs> uh, Nancy ran a really great series on Universe Today where she was doing the same thing, where it was like, where in the solar system is this? You have to guess. That sounds like super fun. Um, okay, great. I think that's all we've got to schedule. Um, the other thing... Okay, so uh, so today is going to be a live episode of Astronomy Cast. We're going to do episode 326 titled Atmospheric Dust. Um, it's going to take us about half an hour to do the episode and then when we're finished we'll stick around and answer any questions that you might have about either what we talked about in the episode or just space and astronomy in general. Uh, Pam, I don't know, how's your time, Pamela? Are you good today? So I, I'm doing fine. I'm looking to see what uh, what questions we do or don't have over on Twitter. Uh, oh, currently good. We don't. I'm just seeing lots of happy retweets, so please feel encouraged to retweet, reshare, the whole nine yards. Uh, we, we've had a hard time getting the Q&A app working, but I think we got it going this time around. So you should be able to click uh, wherever you're watching this on YouTube, whether you're watching it on Google+, Plus or whether you're watching it embedded somewhere. It should say down at the bottom that we're taking questions or join the conversation or something like that. You can click that, and then you'll see all the questions. And then as we answer your questions, we'll highlight them in the, in the broadcast. And it's really cool because later on, then it acts like an index. You can watch the episode. You can see the list of the questions that we answered and click to go to the specific spot in the video where the question got answered, if, if I'm doing this right. Uh, so, for example, uh, some Paul Darrell asks, when you be in Hawaii and where will you visit? Uh, Someday when we have more funding, although I will be out there for the International Astronomical Union meeting summer of 2015. Oh, really? I was going to be in Hawaii? Yeah. Oh, I should probably come. <laughs> You've never been to an IAU before. I know, I know, but but that's because they've been really far away in expensive places, but, but Hawaii... And Hawaii is not both of those things? No, it's... Are you kidding? Vancouver, we go to Hawaii all the time. It's our, it's, it's our version of the Caribbean, so... Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's easier great. for me to get to Beijing. <laughs> wow. Um... <laughs> Okay, great. So, are you all ready there? Um, I guess so. And I have confirmation from Gold that the Q&A app does appear to be working. Yeah. All right. Say when. I am pressing record, and I'm actually in mono, and it's recording, and everything looks good. Working well here, too. All right. Allow me to get an intro. Um, okay, here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 326, Atmospheric Dust. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane, I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. 
Hey, Pema, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing today? Good. Last week we were complaining about cold weather, but now it, it's been relatively balmy for uh, I hate West you with Coast. love. It's great. I totally great. hate you with love. Yeah, no, we have like four or five. It's going to be a, a white Christmas here unless something radical and unpredicted happens. So we get a lot of questions from people about our questions show, which was what we used to do back in the day. We would, you know, we would do our regular episode and then we would do a question show and people wondered, like, how come you don't do the question show? We do the question show every week live on Google+. Plus. So if you ever want to join us and ask your questions about space and astronomy, just watch us live on Google+. Plus. We start at 12 o'clock Pacific, 3 Eastern. And we take about half an hour to do this show, which we're doing right now. But then we also take your questions about space and astronomy and and handle them at the end. So, so people warning about that. It still happens. And and now it's even more timely. So no more waiting for us to air your question. Just be on air with us. Just be on air with us and join us and see what we look like and uh, yeah and ask your questions. So. Uh, we still do that. The other questions people have been asking, whatever happened to the Weekly Space Hangout audio feed, how come it's not in with Astronomy Cast? We got a lot of complaints from people that it was sort of polluting the feed. <laughs> there was too much. But I know a lot of people still really like it. So it's actually in the 365 days of Astronomy feed. So, And there's lots of other good stuff in that feed as well. So it's a great reason to subscribe. You'll get both the the uh, the weekly space hangout plus all of the great episodes that that normally go into the 365. So that's where it is. Cheap astro learning space. Oh, there's so many good things. I've been doing yeah. science fiction stories. Uh, going ahead and doing narration for that. Yeah. So there's a ton of content in the 365 feed. So so if you're wondering what happened to the weekly space hangout, which is still happening every week, you can get it from there. So much space content. <laughs> All right. All right, here we go. So when you consider the hazards of space flight, it's hard to get worked up about dust bunnies. And yet, atmospheric dust is going to be one of the biggest problems astronauts will face when they reach the surface of other worlds. Where does this dust come from, and what does it tell us about the history of other worlds, and what can we do to mitigate the health risks? In my house, we call them dust dragons. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're substantial collections of dust that have achieved <laughs> sentience and require wow. a, a constant battle. Yeah, um, but but so you know you put uh, atmospheric dust on the on the list, and I know uh, you know it's sort of. I mean, we deal with these dust storms here on Earth, which can clog the skies and pretty fantastic, but on other worlds, they're going to be big problems. Well, and it's a completely different kind of problem, depending on what the type of dust it is, what atmospheric height it's at. There, there's so many different things to consider. And the reason that I kind of rolled out of bed this morning and was like, today we're discussing atmospheric dust, is, is because there's actually this upcoming uh, dusty inundation for spacecraft, I guess. We have the LADEE mission that's currently up and happily orbiting the moon, at least as if you feel like anthropomorphizing spacecraft that's happily orbiting the moon. And and it just got this this great take on Shang-Yi, um, the, the Chinese rover that, that landed and uh, probably put a bunch of dust up into the atmosphere. Then we have the MAVEN mission on its way to Mars, and it's going to arrive shortly after uh, the Martian atmosphere gets to deal with a comet racing past. And all of these spacecraft are both getting to uh, look at the zero point of what atmospheres normally look like and then getting to see what happens when they get polluted with all kinds of stuff. Rosetta is going to be harpooning a comet next year, later this year. Well, yeah. 2014. We're almost there. This is crazy. Okay, anyway. So, uh, right, so they're having to deal with this with this dust, and I think it's sort of one of these hazards or, that most people don't think about, but the planners really have to consider it. And the, the other place that, that this atmospheric dust is really going to nail us over time is, so we have to plan missions around it, we have to worry about solar storms, we have to worry about measuring it, but if you've ever gotten sand or dirt in your clothing, you know that sometimes it makes you contemplate getting naked in public because it's really irritating. And um, so as, as we're planning to put people on the moon and on Mars, we need to figure out how to mitigate the effects of dust. 
Okay, so let's, you know, here on Earth, how do we experience this, this dust? Um, so, so, sorry, I got distracted by something flashing across my screen. I am now closing all messaging programs. Could you please repeat that? Uh, no, no. Uh, <laughs> right. So, okay, so, so how do we experience that, that atmospheric dust here on Earth? So, to give us some kind of context. So, so here on Earth, uh, dust comes in in the oh wow the the nearby desert is attacking where I live due to high speed winds. Uh, so we've seen massive effects in Beijing where uh, the not pollution, which is another form of dust, but where the nearby deserts have blown in. We've seen this uh, in Tucson and Phoenix with massive dust storms rolling into the cities. So this is literally the case of wind sweeping up the dust and carrying it along as a, a wall that can clog your lungs, clog your machinery, get into your clothes, get into uh, your cars, and, and it's a wreck. The other way we experience here on Earth is volcanism. Uh, several years ago there was the Icelandic volcano that shall not be pronounced and it threw dust, in this case pulverized pumice stone and silicon bits uh, kilometers up into the Earth's atmosphere where there was a potential danger to aircrafts that would get their windshield scratched to the point that they could no longer be seen through and all sorts of danger to the the engines on these aircraft so well, basically, all air flight was shut down going into Europe for a while. We had uh, Mount St. Helens and back in the 1980s, and it there was like a layer of, of dust, like snow, on everything, all the cars, all the trees, all the houses. Yeah, yeah I was it, living as far south as the Los Angeles Basin, and we experienced Mount St. Helens all the way down there as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so so we've got a sense of what this dust looks like. You know, we've got these wind processes that whip it up into these clouds. And I mean, if you've never seen pictures of these approaching dust storms, they're they're pretty terrifying. Uh, so then let's look at you know a nearby location that doesn't have wind, but the moon is going to have dust, right? Right, and and with the moon, it's actually one of the most bizarre situations where. Uh, the astronauts who were there were able to see atmospheric dust, and we use the word atmospheric loosely here, were able to see dust out on the horizon. And while they knew that during the process of landing they stirred up dust, this was still more than they expected. And uh, earthbound observers have periodically been able to see transient phenomena that could only really be explained as either uh, things that weren't actually being observed or as dust suspended in the atmosphere and with a lot of mathematical modeling it's been realized that high energy photons coming from the sun so x-rays ultraviolet light hitting the dust on the moon uh, actually has the energy necessary to strip electrons off of uh, some of these molecules and as you strip enough electrons off the molecules, you're getting more and more and more positively charged dust until the dust actually starts repelling itself and these individual grains of dust are capable of suddenly floating up above the lunar surface and so you end up with an electrostatically suspended layer of dust above the moon. Is it is this somewhat related to like when we see these great big volcanic explosions, these eruptions? They always have these these uh, lightning bolts going through them, right? Because the the dust sort of just rubbing together sets up huge static electricity. So so the physics behind these two things is completely different. In this this case, oh, never mind then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so with the dust on the moon, what what we're actually looking at in many ways is. Um, nature's way of, of saying, hey, Einstein got it right, because when you shine the correct color of light onto something, the electrons 
fly away. This is the photoelectric effect. So the photoelectric effect writ large on the surface of the moon with sunlight being involved will cause charged particles, in this case dust grains, to get so charged that they repel themselves away from the surface. The electromagnetic effect, um, its force overcomes that of gravity. Now this dust on the moon is bad news. I mean, yes. it is, it is, it is really trouble. This, this is, uh, well, it's generally dust made of glass. And one of the most traumatizing, yet humorous, posters I've ever seen at a science conference was being presented about uh, experiments that are being done where they actually will go to slaughter yards where pigs are being slaughtered and get the freshly removed skin from pigs and use um, artificial lunar dust. So they, they look up the chemical composition of lunar dust and recreate it in the laboratory, take this dust with them to a slaughter yard, take the pig skin of the freshly dead pig, and then using um, carefully measured precise pressure and uh, pressure over time, so how long they exert the pressure, they will grind the dust into the pig skin with different fabrics to figure out which fabric causes the least abrasion to occur and try and understand what do we need to make that la layer of fabric between the astronaut and his spacesuit made out of so that, well, those future astronauts uh, get the least abrasion to their skin. Yeah, if you read the reports that came back from from Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and the other astronauts, you know this dust, you know, as they carried it back into the spacecraft, it got everywhere, and it was not the sort of nice smooth sand that we're so used to. As you said, it's little pieces of glass that that the bombarding of of micrometeorites over the billions of years has just chewed up the landscape into this field of glassy dust. And like they were breathing it, and it's getting in their lungs. Like this is this is going to be a big problem. This stuff makes asbestos look friendly at a certain layer, um, and you can't just use filters to get rid of lunar dust because it's so tiny in some cases. And when we're looking at the dust on places like the Moon and Mars the dust doesn't settle out of the atmosphere in as permanent a way as it does here on Earth. Here on Earth you get atmospheric dust, whether it be from uh, some volcano going off, be, whether it be from, well, weather stirring it up out of a desert, whatever the source, and we have to remember forest fires, their soot is a form of dust, pollution is a form of dust, all of these different forms of dust have the opportunity to eventually settle into water. Most of the surface of the earth is made up of water and when the water and the dust mix, well, the, the dust is removed. On the moon, it just moves around and the constant impact of micrometeors and larger meteors is generating new dust. Same is true on Mars. And so there's nothing to get rid of the dust. It just gets blown around, settles back down, gets blown around some more, gets settles back down. It's a never-ending problem. So, okay, so let's look at some other planets then, um, like like Mars, for example. I mean, it's classic for its dust storms, these global dust storms that can just encase the entire planet in this red mist. And, and in this case, the composition is slightly different. You have more iron oxides, giving Mars its awesome red color. Um, so this dust is dangerous in slightly different ways. And what's kind of amazing is these giant dust storms that you see essentially enshrouding the entire world. We were extremely worried when we first started spent sending spacecraft with solar panels to Mars that this dust would have the effect of killing the, the rovers off rather quickly. But as we learned with Spirit and Opportunity, well, first of all, what the wind brings, it also takes away. So while they did end up covered in dust, the wind would periodically clean them off nice and neat. Um, but the dust also isn't as thick as we might have thought. It turns out that globally that dust uh, that gets chewed up into the atmosphere is only about three microns thick. So that's 
three strands of hair basically thick if you take all the dust that gets put into the atmosphere and settle it all back out across the surface of the world. And it doesn't require a lot of wind speed to get that dust moving. I mean, I think when you see it in movies and television shows, it's like a horrible windstorm with clogging dust and, you know, everyone's in great danger. But the reality is that it, you'd barely feel it. You know, the, the visibility would be reduced, but it would be perfectly safe, I think, to, to stand out in that, in that windstorm, that dust storm, and go about your business. So it's not as bad as, and, as we, we would expect. And, and with Mars, the, the gravity is significantly lower than it is here on Earth. And that means that it doesn't take as much force to get the dust to overcome gravity, essentially. Um, but the other side of this is because the Martian atmosphere is so much, so much thinner than the atmosphere here on Earth, that dust stays in the atmosphere longer here on Earth. So you get these sudden dust storms blowing up and almost as quickly they settle back down and so that's kind of neat. Uh, here it can take a couple of years for the dust from a volcano to settle out of the atmosphere. I think it's also important to note that the dust on Mars is not as dangerous as the stuff we've talked about on the moon because you've got this wind action that's blowing this dust around and eroding it and smoothing it and you know you're gonna get dust everywhere but it's not gonna be the same tiny pieces of glass getting into your lungs. It's yeah. It's much more a thing about the the wind version of rounded rocks on the beach. This this constant interaction and like I said, the composition is just not the same. It's not made out of uh, broken up glasses. It's made up of completely different sets of minerals. Yeah, I mean, think about the I think about the moon. Like imagine a you know someone took a big piece of volcanic glass, like you know it's really nice basal you know basal glass, and just smashed it up. And then just into a powder, like, ugh, what a nightmare that would be. Um, okay, so then we've talked about Mars a bit, and we've talked about Earth. So, so, but I mean, even asteroids, this might be an issue, right? Yeah, and with asteroids, it's a different type of issue, and we're still trying to figure it out. In general, asteroids, they don't have a whole lot of mass. That means they don't have a whole lot of gravity. So when you shoot things at asteroids or when the universe shoots things at asteroids for us, you'd expect the impact to, for the most part, send things into a gravitationally escaping motion. Um, most of that dust isn't going to settle straight back down to the asteroid itself. But when we look at asteroids, we see in higher numbers than were expected boulders. And boulders, just like dust, you'd expect to, to have escape velocities after an impact. And what it appears is happening is over time, the sunlight hitting an asteroid followed by that same asteroid going into shadow is heating and cooling and heating and cooling and heating and cooling over and over and over until the rock breaks. And so you can end up with thermal conditions leading to things fragmenting, leading to dust being created. So it's a completely different process. So when we land on asteroids, we're not going to have the same dust issues that we have on the moon. They, they simply aren't going to hold on to as much dust, but we still are going to have dust that we have to worry about. Hmm. And I know that a lot of uh, like comets are comprised of a high amount of both rock and ice and you get those interactions of that heating and cooling that's going on that's going to be creating another particular set of, of dust. And, and you also end up with different chemical reactions occurring on the surface of the ices that can lead to larger and larger molecules being found. And essentially uh, the, the simple definition of dust is it's a molecule of something that doesn't melt when exposed to normal amounts of sunlight. So you have chemical reactions occurring that build these larger and larger molecules and this can occur with sunlight hitting the surface of the ice, creating organics through different chemical reactions and then when the ice surrounding these different molecules gets sublimated, melts straight from solid to gas, the dust ends up getting shot away from the surface of the comet, creating tails that are made out of stuff 
as well as just plain Jane gases. Hmm. So, and then of course, as we have these meteor showers, this is us in many cases getting hit by these microscopic pieces of dust that emanated from the comets and asteroids. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So then I guess, you know, as researchers are looking at the dust, you know, what, you know, as they're trying to study it, I know that the, like the Curiosity rover is designed to look out through the atmosphere of Mars. You know, what kinds of information they're trying to glean from the dust? Well, at, at a certain level, there's the, uh, well, dust, it changes the color of light hitting the surface of a world. Dust preferentially scatters light uh, that is at shorter wavelengths, creating a reddening of the light that gets through. If we can get enough dust in the Earth's atmosphere, that will have the effect of cooling our world. We need a good giant volcano to go off and spew dust into our atmosphere to help cool things down. Um, there's people who've tried to figure out, can we artificially generate the dust that's needed? I, we have to worry about the biological effects as uh, human beings inadvertently end up breathing in lunar dust, Martian dust that gets through into future human settlements. How bad an effect is that going to have on our lungs? We, we've learned a lot from cigarettes. We've learned a lot from pollution. We've learned a lot even from people who are dealing with nanoparticles. Well, there's the potential for a lot of disease in the future, so we have to figure that out. Um, there's so many different reasons to worry about dust, both the good effects of cooling off worlds and the bad effects of potentially killing humans. And so we're trying to learn all of that as we study the dust. I mean, you brought up this concept of geoengineering, that we could release all this dust into the atmosphere and, and, a, and it could cool down the planet as a way to prevent global warming. And it just sounds like a horrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But, but you know, you, you get this situation where it might be the only idea that you've got left apart from... from the world overheating. So, and and in the grand scheme of things, ideas of launching like a, a bazillion small satellites with reflectors, um, I'd rather have dust in our upper atmosphere. We've at least experienced that enough times over uh, human history to understand how long it takes for volcan volcanic dust and similar composition dust to settle back out of the atmosphere. It's always good to have reversible phenomena. Right, yeah. Now, I don't want to put you on the spot. Is there dust on Venus? Um, there should be, but I don't know what frequency the sulfuric acid rainstorms occur at, so I'm not sure um, how... I'm not sure of the phase change frequency where you have dust that's created through various... Uh, effects becoming mud or clay and getting redissolved into the soils. Yeah, and the atmosphere is like gross. Ninety-three times more dense, like the surface pressure than than Earth. So I wonder, like, would things get more suspended? Would they? Would be like a fluid, like a. It's like a like if you're on the surface of Venus, it's like you're a kilometer underneath the ocean. Well, so there's both massive winds and a much thicker atmosphere. So that means that any dust that was able to survive the acidic nature of the atmosphere could be suspended for months and months and months at a time. Another place that's really fascinating is Titan. When you think about Titan, it's got about double the density of our atmosphere, double the surface pressure on the surface, but it's got this terrible cold, and yet it rains hydrocarbons. And, and so here... Um, there, there's the potential for all sorts of organic molecules to bind together to form dust. Um, and, and in this case, with the frequent rainstorms, you have to wonder how much of it's going to be the, the equivalent of dust that gets trapped up in the Earth's rainstorms. When it rains, you, you often get pollutants tied in with the rains as well, or sandy dust tied in with the raindrops as well. So yes, there's dust on Titan, but you also have rainstorms. And so again, you have to wonder, is it nice dry dust or nice methane wet dust in this case? And what about... Io. I mean, it's it's amazing how how each of these worlds it just takes a different form. I mean, think about Io with the the volcanic plumes that fly up off up above the surface of the moon and rain back down. And and so you're again going to have the volcanic dust. Um, in this case, also just escaping away from Io. So you have that 
uh, helping to add to the dusty rings that are around Jupiter and this is part of what you see with um, Enceladus uh, orbiting Saturn where its ice geysers are helping to contribute to the rings of Saturn. And on Europa. And on Europa. You hear that? Brand new, yeah, brand new I research, did. right? Yeah. That, that they found uh, ice geysers coming out of Europa. But but we still don't, I haven't seen results on if, if those are contributing to Jupiter's rings. I know Enceladus is. Right, no, no, absolutely. But we, and we don't know, we don't know if it's actually welling up from below the surface, like the actual ocean underneath right. Europa, or whether it's closer to the surface and it's just some kind of grinding effect, but there is there is water ice emanating from Europa and going into the atmosphere. And that is just like another reason to get to Europa and put a <laughs> spacecraft there. I cannot wait. So, cool. Okay, well, thank you very much, Pamela. It's my pleasure. Stop and or save. Oh, yes. I'm completely spaced out. For my birthday, I let myself sleep as much as I wanted yesterday. That seems like a really lame birthday gift to give yourself, but seriously, uh, that I needed awesome. it. That sounds awesome. Are you kidding? And I just feel like I still haven't fully woken up. Um, maybe this is just a dream. This is one of those astronomy cast nightmares. No. I don't have those. I just continue to have nightmares that I didn't pass a math class, and they're going to take all my degrees away. Really? <laughs> All right. Can they do that? No. Okay. I have, in all reality, passed all the math classes I've ever taken. All right. All right, I've saved mine. I'm going to upload, and then there's a bunch of cool questions. We'll get to that. Yeah, I don't see any questions right now on yeah. Twitter. Twitter. Hey, I've seen you more and more on I Twitter know, lately. I know. I'm using Twitter. I, I will admit I'm F. Kane at Twitter. <laughs> I finally come out of my Twitter shell and I'm using it. So, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, you happy? Um, you ready there? Hmm. You ready? You saved? Is it all safe? Yeah. Everything safe. Okay. Yeah. I have trouble finding my drive, but I will do this in a bit. Weird. Okay. Uh. Cool. Okay, so questions. Uh, so Pete Wall asks, uh, do the gas giants have a similar dust to that of the rocky bodies, Moon, Mars, etc.? Hmm. Is there dust in Jupiter? Uh, I, yes, but formed through chemical processes, not through mushing up of solid things processes. Dust just means that there's molecules that are big. Right, and so most of Jupiter is going to be hydrogen and helium, but it's going to be absorbing and having dust that's coming in. And But in many cases, is it going to be sinking down inside the planet? Good question. Um, it, it'll stay stirred up. And <laughs> someone's asking for clarification on when my birthday was. My birthday was last Thursday, um, but I had to go give a talk and work and blah and blah. Happy birthday. And, and so I didn't actually get to celebrate my birthday until yesterday when I simply slept until I was done sleeping and then I slept some more. Uh, Brian Hudson asks, oh, I love the Q&A app, um, <laughs> how many microns across is a grain of talcum powder? Is this lunar dust, is lunar dust this fine? That's a good question. Um, good. Lunar dust can be a whole lot finer than talcum powder. I'm just going to look it up right now. Uh, 12 micron sized particles is talcum powder. I want to um, say smaller than 3 microns is what gets easily suspended. Um, dust micron, sorry. Um, so, so the article I'm looking at talks one micron. About, one, yeah, yeah. So we can get as small as one micron. So way small. It's smaller than one micron. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there you go. Trouble. Little shards of glass going in your lungs. Yeah, um, let's not do that. Okay. Uh, Jamie McIlvaney asks, how much can the dust particles tell us about the geological makeup of the body they originated from? Um, 
it depends on if we know the origins of the dust particles. So here on Earth, this is something that geologists regularly do, is they look at the different sedimentary layers. And sedimentary layers uh, are built up by material that has been transported one way or another. So you can get sedimentary layers built up by fluid flow, so fluvial processes, and from um, wind conducting it, so aeolian processes. And when you look at all of these different layers, uh, retrospectively you're able to say this layer here is from a volcano that went off. This layer here is probably from massive forest fires. And so we're able to learn about the history of our own Earth. Now when we go to other worlds and we start looking at the dust, um, I think we're probably going to have to work on coming up with different techniques that will similarly allow us to understand about the history of the world by looking at the buildup over time of the dust. Currently when we look at dust all it can tell us is this exists somewhere on the world but we don't know if it's getting thrown up from the internal parts of the planet through one set of processes or yeah you, you have to know the origins of something and sometimes that requires lots of brainstorming and looking at things within historical contexts. But I think your you know your comment about this exists I think is, is quite valuable I mean if you have a way to collect dust and you're searching for certain kinds of elements or certain molecules for example the kinds of molecules that might be created with the presence of water over long periods of time. Yeah, no, that's that's super interesting. So, so dust right? allows us to understand these things exist, which which is awesome. But uh, dust within historic context allows you to understand so much more. So missions like Laddie and Maven are going to tell us what dust is present and what compositional. Um, amounts and frequencies and size frequencies and all of that is cool. Um, I love what we can learn about dust given historic context and sedimentary layers that we can examine. So um, more missions next time. Let's dig cross sections and take core samples and all that sort of awesome stuff. More missions, more better. Uh, Barry Diamond asks, I don't know about this, can the dust be used in some way? Is dust-laden air better for wind farms or some other use? And I'm going to sort of tweak it a little further, like what about that that static electricity? Could you, I don't know, harvest electricity? No, so somehow? actually the dust on the moon is, is a serious problem that people are trying to figure out how to mitigate. Um, one of the coolest things I've ever seen presented was there's a research lab at I believe the University of Tennessee, but maybe Tennessee State University, um, where they figured out that a certain type of microwave light, if hit on lunar dust, will cause the lunar dust to melt. And so you can essentially drive along with um, lunar dust, with uh, microwave light hitting the lunar dust on the underside of the vehicle and create nice solid glassy surfaces. And so they're looking at potential future technologies that use this microwave radiation to melt landings, uh, slabs, to melt roads. Wow, to so make roads down. and stuff. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah. So I have a question coming in on Twitter from uh, at Red5 2013 who asks, do you think that China's interest in the moon might be the kick in the backside NASA needs to get serious about a moon base? No. Um, I, I, I'm very much afraid that NASA doesn't need a kick in the backside. It knows it needs to go back to the moon and the people who need the kick in the backside are the people who set NASA's budget. So here we're looking at Senate, House of Representatives and I don't think they care. Um, so, no, I don't think this is going to help. All right. Um, another question from Jamie McIlvenny. Um, with geoengineering, how much dust would need to be released into the atmosphere to make a sizable effect? How certain are we of the long-term consequences? I'm, I'm certain that we don't know what the long-term consequences are. Is there anything I could be certain of? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think we actually probably have a 
better understanding of the long-term consequences of putting a lot of dust into the atmosphere than we have for many other ideas. From multiple different core samples uh, taken in different locations, we've actually been able to, to start to measure how much dust was thrown into the air through different volcanic eruptions, through different impact events. And by studying things ranging from the impact that killed the dinosaurs and put tons of material into the atmosphere to simple run-of-the-mill um, volcanoes erupting to massive forest fires. All of these different things have left sedimentary signatures. And they've also left, in more recent cases, tree ring signatures. And by comparing forest growth and different dust layers, um, it starts to allow us to put pieces together and understand what are kill-off amounts of dust versus what are cooling off amounts of dust. Right. Uh, this isn't to say we fully understand it, just that we understand it better than things like launching a bazillion small satellites with mirrors on them. Right, or releasing uh, other kinds of gases into the atmosphere or right. attempting to you know, release tremendous amounts of iron into the ocean to change right. the, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Um, so Ronnie Pearson asks, uh, crazy question perhaps, but I know that there is molecular clouds in space containing water molecules. And dust. And dust, yeah. I mean, we have a whole episode just on dust, but we're talking more mm -hmm. about the dust in, in sort of around newly forming stars and things like mm -hmm. that. So is it possible that they could form ice planets? No. Um, and and the, the simple reason is that the reason these giant, gorgeous, dust-filled clouds are hanging out being gorgeous, beautiful, dust-filled clouds is because gas pressure is essentially suspending all of the gas, dust particles and gas apart, and the dust cloud hasn't been impacted by a shock wave or anything else that will cause it to collapse down. Once that sort of collapse begins, it's stars that end up getting formed and around those stars, planets including ice giants. Uh, Thomas Trenniker asks, uh, could you hang a wire from the International Space Station down to the Earth? Would you get a current induced in the wire as an alternative to solar panels? Um, yes, that actually works. You don't have to hang it that far down. Um, I think we did an episode on this. Yeah, on space tethers? Ago. On tethers? On, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the downside, right, is that it, you get an atmospheric drag, right? Right. So it, it's a complex issue. Um, so yes, you get electricity, but you still need propulsion to, to not fall into the atmosphere. Right, and solar panels yeah. are are great. So, especially in space. Yeah. Um, Chuck Tolsma asks, have dust storms on exoplanets been detected? Hmm. I don't think we have the ability to do that quite yet, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I don't know. I can't recall a story. Because we don't have the ability to get that level of color difference. Mm -hmm. I don't remember any spectroscopic measurements that were indicative of dust in particular. So the only thing that's been sort of... People have proposed models that you could end up with certain classes of exoplanets that have a relationship with their parent star where there's so much heating and winds that you actually get... Um, uh, the surface is so hot that the rock and stuff turns into dust and then gets blown around the entire planet with these enormous planet-sized windstorms. So, okay. Yeah, So and, and weird kind of electrical conductivity on the surface of the planet and stuff. So, so, but I don't think anything has actually been detected. Okay. Um, oh, good question. So Bob uh, Harkins asks, uh, what comprises the dust that can, creates the zodiacal light? Uh, that's all sorts of random dust. Um, so it's the stuff that came from comet tails. It's the stuff that didn't get swept up when the universe, not the universe, when the solar system was formed. Um, 
it's uh, yeah, it's all kinds of dust. Interstellar dust, interplanetary dust. It's just like the it's the in between the solar system, like in between the planets is just this dust, and we're seeing yeah. it in these very special situations. And it gets yeah. generated in all different ways and left over in all different ways. Uh, the dust particles are between 10 and 30 micrometers in diameter, most of the mass around 150 micrograms, says Wikipedia. <laughs> so, um, uh, ooh, good question as well. This is so much fun. Okay, I like this so much. <laughs> I have understood that the surface of Mars has poisons for chlorites everywhere. Is this also part of the dust? Um... So perchlorates are usually found in ices. If it was in the atmosphere, it would have been detected a whole lot sooner than Phoenix. So my scientific guess without looking up the answer I just looked is, it up. Okay. <laughs> Mine was no. What's well, yours? Yes. It is. Yeah, so um, the sort of fairly recent evidence uh, is that there are, they're finding per perchlorates, like Curiosity has found them within Gale Crater, they're laden in uh, dust devils. Oh, okay. Yeah. But are they intrinsic in the atmosphere or are they tied into dust devils? Uh, I think they're on the surface, so the dust devils are digging them up off the surface okay. and, then, and then pulling them around the, okay, in the atmosphere. Okay, so, okay. And that would explain why we haven't seen them before. Okay. Um, they're in the atmosphere until they've sublimated. Yeah, well, so the the the, the perchlorate is in the soil, and this is sort mm -hmm. of this poisonous. This is one of the ideas that sort of runs against the possibility that there's life on Mars. That you've got this perchlorate poison essentially equally distributed in the upper layer of the surface of the soil on Mars, but then these dust devils come through and pull it up into the atmosphere, and it actually might be a risk for Mar for Mars explorers that that they're going to get the stuff on themselves and, you know, potentially it's going to follow them as they go through airlocks and stuff. So, just another <laughs> danger. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, but it wasn't detected until uh, Phoenix, which was one of those things that when they realized it was there, it screwed up some of our understanding of different Viking measurements, and we discussed that in a whole episode in the past. Uh, Pete Wall asks, is it even possible to create filters that could remove the lunar dust? Yeah, no, that stuff is just way too fine. Showers. Yeah, like, no, like it's going to be true. serious. Like I, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. They're going to get to this point where they're going to, you know, they're going to get other spacesuits. They're going to have to have multiple levels of showers, and they're really going to have to scrub themselves down to get that stuff. Because if it even just gets inside the yeah, but the base, where's the water going to come I from? I don't know. Wait, what they're actually looking at um, is current spacesuits. You go into the airlock. You put on your spacesuit, you leave, you come back, you take off your spacesuit. And so that means that you and your spacesuit can sort of like stand there and poke one another in the chest. Um, if your spacesuit doesn't have someone in it and pokes you in your chest, run. Um, that said, in the future, to try and avoid you and the outside of your spacesuit being coexisting in the same air-filled space, they're looking to have it so that you basically slide into your spacesuit and then climb back out. Uh, and there's some great images of this with the Desert Rats program that is testing these technologies out in the Mojave Desert, I believe. Uh, so future spacesuits, you lock the spacesuit into the, the airlock and right. climb out. And as long as that seal is good, you don't have to worry the same way you worry today. Right. So that spacesuit is never coming inside the habitat. You are. It is always almost outside, and then you climb into it, and then the top and the bottom, and they get somehow clamped together, and at no point has the dust gotten inside the... the that, that's a really neat idea. I mean, you can sort of imagine how... You, You'd walk up with your spacesuit into some kind of device, and then it would pressurize around you, and then kind of disconnect the spacesuit, and you would climb out of it. Oh, you're making it the... way too complicated. No way. It's, it's it's simply a hatch in the back of the spacesuit, so you just slide in. Right, but I'm saying like you don't like go look, like our traditional understanding, right? Is you're in the spacesuit, you come inside the airlock, the airlock oh, yeah. opens up, and the dust is going to get everywhere. But if you just leave those spacesuits outside, yeah. 
you know, it's like when you walk out to the door, you got muddy boots, and you walk out to the outside of your door, and then you put your boots on, and then you and you walk outside. So, um, okay, I think I've I've cracked it. <laughs> I'll, I'll talk to Elon Musk. Um, uh, Tech Phoenix asks, would diamond dust, also known as ice crystals, be a significant concern for existing or future Antarctic observatories? Don't know. Don't know. But, I mean, uh, Antarctica is the best place to build an observatory, so who cares? Yeah, so the fact right? that we haven't run into this as being a significant problem yet tells me probably not. I mean, Dome C on Antarctica is, like, the best place to put a, an observatory on Earth. It's the equivalent of a desert. It's high altitude. The, the atmosphere is still and clear and cold. It's just a horrible, horrible place to try and get to to build an observatory. So there's three, there's there's one t telescope has been built at this place so far, like and, and like a half meter telescope. And it was, and they could barely get the thing working. There's two more coming. The Chinese are working on this. Um, and it's like, but it, but you get a telescope there, and it is better than almost anywhere on Earth. So, so I don't know whether diamond the ice crystals are a problem. I don't know. Maybe sometimes. Like when there's clouds in the sky? No idea. I just yeah. know it's not something I've read about. So if it's a problem, it's not a super serious problem. Uh, Lance INTJ asks, just curious, what is your favorite object to through, view through a telescope? I'll bet you know what mine is. <laughs> it's, oh, which nebula is it? I want to say Rosetta. That's the one, the Rosetta. Okay. Yeah. And then planet, I'm sure you know what my favorite planet is to see through a telescope. Saturn, Saturn, Saturn. Yeah, yeah that's right. I bet you don't know any of mine. I'm going to guess some kind of obscure variable star. Mm -hmm. No, not to view through a telescope. No? Those are good to take repeat boring images of, but they... No, I don't know. What is your best object to view through a telescope? I love looking at the tarantula, the tarantula nebula through a telescope because it actually looks like you're getting stared at by a tarantula if, if it's just a regular everyday 16-inch or something. Yeah, well, only visible from the southern hemisphere. Psha! So, I so I'm not even sure this even exists. <laughs> <laughs> if I can't see it, it's not there. No. Yeah. So, so northern hemisphere, I, I'm partial with really big telescopes to the Owl Nebula. Oh, that's a great one, yeah. Um, Corey Schmitz has just moved down to uh, South Africa. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, and has been taunting me with images of the tarantula and zebras out his back door and stuff. It's great. Oh, jeez. Um, okay. I think those are all the questions here. Uh, okay. Uh, Sylvan Westby asks, do future generations have to worry about silicosis when settling on worlds without water? What about Mars regolith? So this is this uh, silicosis, this is like miners, coal miners get this dust in oh, their lungs and right. and it causes, a, it's a horrible disease and you know they many will die from it. So the thinking right now is yeah, right? Like on the moon, if you spend a lot of time breathing this moon dust, yeah. it's a problem. And, and one of the other places that people have been concerned is there hasn't been a lot of regulation on dealing with nanoparticles yet. So you have happy-go-lucky academic, ac academics uh, playing in their lab, and they have students in their lab, and you're just building stuff and creating stuff like buckyballs, and no one fully understands what the repercussions are going to be. Yeah. I mean, people have, like, skin creams with nanoparticles in them. Like, it's... Yeah, I totally agree that this is a whole area of research that we really don't understand the consequences of what of what's going to happen. Like, what is the long-term consequences of, as you say, breathing in a cloud of buckyballs? Yeah. That would be an awfully embarrassing way to die. How did he die? Buckyball inhalation. <laughs> um, well, you never know. I mean, it, this stuff gets... I mean, look at the, uh, the amount of plastic that's in the environment, and it's yeah. just getting churned up into smaller and smaller. I mean, you eat fish now... And its skin, its its flesh is inundated with plastic particles. And mercury. And and mercury, you know. But so, you know, which one is worse? We don't know. Um, but, and you've got the Great Pacific Gyre, right, with this, yeah. this uh, floating, That's spinning insane. island of plastic in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So, 
who knows what what the effect of this stuff is. I I think it's something that you know it's weird because I am so pro science. I am so as you know I am enthusiastic about this kind of stuff on every front. But I'm a little nervous. I gotta say about about these micro part these uh, nanoparticles and the research on it. So I'm again it. Um, Chris Bamford says, who would have thought dust would be such an interesting subject? <laughs> Pamela knew. That's who. <laughs> put it on the list. Um, okay. Let's see what else we got. Uh, Tom Nathy notes that lunar dust is death for seals, like for doors that shut out the atmosphere away from the vacuum. What? So Tom Nathy says that lunar dust is death for seals. Not not seals in the water, but seals around the Oh, dorm. thank you. Okay. Yes. Rain went entirely the yeah, wrong place. You, okay. you were thinking water seals, but no, no. <laughs> uh, no, the seals for, for doors, right? And so you yes. get this lunar dust scratching away at the seals. It's going to start to re you know, reduce its um, vacuum pressure. So yeah. totally agree. Big problem. Um, yeah, I went straight to yeah. sea mammal from Antarctica and could not compute. Um, well, I think that's good. I think we're out of time, and I think we've handled a zillion questions. So I think we're good. So okay. thanks again, Pamela. What's the uh, the next episode that's happening for Learning Space, I guess? Learning Space is next. It's... Um, Actually, I might, I might be lying on that. Um, check out the CosmoQuest newsletter. It will tell you. And the reason I'm not sure is the research center that Nicole, Georgia, Corey, and I all work in is moving to temporary offices so they can refurbish our science building. And um, we're not entirely sure what to think of this, but they're moving us into the annex of the gymnasium. Right. Well, at least you have a place to work out if you need to. <laughs> exactly. Um, so we've put the uh, the virtual star party on hiatus until the new year. So the we've got two more weeks, and it's just you know everyone's got Christmas, and it's just really hard, and the weather's always so terrible. So it's been but really we'll hard to kind of pull it. Star everyone. party, not star party, weekly space hangout. Yeah, so we're still gonna do the weekly space hangout from that as best I can. You know, you never know who can show up and who can't. So, but we definitely will be trying to do it on Friday and and the next Friday. So, um, but. The next virtual star party is going to be in uh, the 7th of January, so okay. a couple weeks off. Cool. Okay, but, but we've got another episode for next week. I think we're going to be talking about building telescopes for the next yes. couple of weeks. Yeah, we've got three episodes you can do planned. While you have vacation days. Did you know that you can make a telescope out of a used photocopier um, lens? No, that's awesome. Yeah, I was going to just as a piece of thing to research. Uh, Dave Dickinson was mentioning this. That you can, you know, if you get your hands on an old uh, photocopier, you can you can get the lens out of it, and you could turn that into a telescope. Strange reasons to go to your local dump. There you go. <laughs> um, cool. cool. All right. All right. Well, thanks again, Pamela. It was great to see you, and we'll see you next week. Sounds thanks everyone great. for watching.